Hey, I love bass fishing in the spring. It's great just to get out on the water again. Those warm days bring out all the sights and smells of nature. The fishing's great, too. Lots of fast action. But the challenge is finding the fish fast, because they're moving around a lot. morning they're gonna be doing it Jim. Stick those in that corner there, Jim. Right over stronger. I'm ready to go. Okay, good luck. Yeah. Pick me up uh, late afternoon. Right. Maybe this evening if they're going good. from under that boat. Another, I can't tell if that's big enough to be a male or a female. If it's a male, it's a big one, but it's still a nice northern fish. You know, by watching this program and applying the information in our guidebook, you're gonna start catching more largemouth bass in spring of the year like this than ever before. You're gonna have a lot more fun fishing because you're gonna be catching a lot more bass under a wide variety of conditions. But more importantly, you're gonna know why you're catching those fish. In this program, we'll be applying the In Fisherman Mastery System of Fishing, the system that we had informed you about earlier in this mastery series. Our formula is based on three variables. First, you have to understand the largemouth bass and his basic nature. Secondly, the environment he lives in, in this case, a lake, and how they have to respond to cover, to wind, to water clarity, a host of conditions. And third, but a very important part of his presentation, what's the best lure for you to use for the conditions you're faced with? You put all three of these principles together, and you're going to achieve success. In bass fishing, it's important that you understand the seasonal movements that the largemouth bass have to make in a natural lake like this. There's times that most of the fish can be in very shallow water. There's times most of them can be in deep water, like from the drop-off area, say about 12 to 15 feet. And then there's times that these fish can be scattered all over from the shallows down as deep as 15 or 18 feet. You have to have an understanding of how largemouth bass relate to drop-offs, to cover, to edges. This is very, very important as far as their activity goes. There's times, based on local weather and water conditions, that fish can be very active. Other situations can cause most of the population to be inactive. This determines what lures you use and how you fish them. We'll talk more on this later. Early in a season, like now, you want to choose what we term a search lure, a bait that can be fished somewhat fast, yet very efficient. The object is to cover a lot of water, stay on the most aggressive fish for the longest possible time. It's that simple. In this program, you're going to learn to apply these principles to largemouth bass fishing in natural lakes. You're going to learn how to find fish. You're going to know they're there because of certain behavioral patterns that make them come to certain places during certain conditions. And more importantly, we're going to show you how to catch them out of each one of these situations. Hey, I gotta be honest with you. This information can make you a danger to the bass fisheries. No, you can't fish out a lake, but fishing pressure can destroy the population balance that makes it a good fishing lake. To preserve our fisheries, especially in the colder lakes in the northern part of the country, I strongly recommend that you practice catch and release. Now let's fill out that first variable in our formula for success in its location. Obviously, you have to find fish before you can catch fish. And in spring of the year, on natural lakes, that's really pretty easy.
In this chapter, Al will show you the key locations in a natural lake that attract bass during the spring. Put yourself in a bass's place. It's springtime and the sun is gradually warming those cold waters. Your metabolism is picking up and you're starting to rove about. You swim into the shallow waters and if it feels good, you stay. When the temperature's right, you try to reproduce. You don't really choose to do any of these things. You do what you have to do because that's what nature has programmed you to do. You know, too many anglers think you gotta outsmart a bass like this to catch him. Well, that really isn't true. The bass doesn't think and make choices like you and I do. He simply responds to the conditions in the environment he's living in. Nature has programmed him to do what he has to do. To catch bass consistently, you don't have to outsmart them, you have to understand them. As far as bass locations go in natural lakes, we already know quite a bit about them. Any natural temperate zone lake goes through tremendous seasonal changes as it warms up in spring, reaches a peak in summer, and then cools down in fall and winter. This cycle of seasonal changes determines where the bass will be located in a lake. It also affects their behavior. So to be a successful angler, I have to understand how the seasons affect largemouth bass. To deal with seasonal changes, we develop the in-fisherman calendar of fish activity. It works for all game fish in natural lakes. In this case, we're talking about largemouth bass. Our calendar divides the year up into periods. Each period corresponds with certain lake conditions. Because our calendar is natural, the dates of each period will change from lake to lake and from year to year. The calendar helps me interpret what I observe on a lake. Water temperature, growth of cover in a lake, these are natural signs. All those things give us clues about where the bass will be located and how we should fish for them. In the pre-spawn period, the warmer temperatures in the shallows draw bass out of their deep, cold water haunts. During the spawn period, bass concentrate in good nest building areas. The growing amount of weed cover in a lake causes the fish to disperse during the post-spawn period. And during pre-summer, there are groups of bass now located at all depths, down to the deeper water drop-offs. Summer peak is a short period when the lake explodes with activity. There is a tremendous bite along the outer edges of weed lines. In summer, groups of bass tend to settle down and remain in specific locations. Patterns of activity appear, disrupted by day-to-day -day changes in the weather. Post-summer begins when cold nights start to kill off the cover in the lake. Bass remain in the shallows, flats, and deep weeds, but there is a pronounced shift to shallow cover. Because of falling temperatures and mixing of water layers, there is almost no fish activity during the turnover period. But when the cold water period is in full swing, the action returns to the outer fringes of the flats and in deep water locations where there are remnants of green cover. During the pre-spawn, spawn, and post-spawn periods, water temperature and the need to reproduce are the key factors that determine a bass's location. Because of these factors, some locations get a lot more use than others. Let's take a look at these locations. Most bass in a cold water period will be out here along a drop-off like this. They'll be relating to these last clumps of live green weeds. If there's no weeds in a lake, it could be rock piles, or it could be the sharp drop-off itself. As the spring sun starts to warm the waters, the bass's internal clock says, hey, it's time to get in in the shallow water and start to spawn. At this point, big schools of bass start moving into the shallow water, but not just any shallow water. The first areas to warm up in a lake are the sheltered bays, particularly those in the northwest corner of the lake. The best locations will be sheltered from cold north winds by the surrounding terrain or trees. Bays with a black bottom absorb more sunlight and warm up faster than those with a light sandy bottom. Last year's weeds, mats of lily pad roots, objects in the water, all these things provide spots of warmth and edges for the bass to use. Man-made channels warm up fast too. They have shallow water that is isolated from the main lake, shelter from the wind, and often a dark bottom. Little pockets in the shoreline are the something different edges that attract and hold bass. Usually the warmest water, 
and the most bass are at the back end of the channel, farthest from the main lake. The nice thing about pre-spawn bass fishing is that it'll concentrate the fish in a lot of the shallow water bays and channels. The challenging part is they'll hold there for a little while and poof, they'll be gone again. Here's what actually happens. A big bunch of fish on a nice warm sunny day will move up over a flat like this, wander into shallow water and come into this bay here. Another group of fish will do the same thing and maybe go into this channel. It cools off in the afternoon and these same bunches of fish wander right back out to the flats and they drop off again. Some shallow water areas get a lot more use than others. During a pre-spawn period, the bass are constantly roaming these shallow water bays looking for warm water. I have to learn to distinguish what shallow water areas are the best and I have to fish them fast. As the shallow water warms to the low to mid 60s, the male bass begin sweeping out nests and trying to attract females to spawn. Most bass will try to build nests in shallow water that has a thin layer of silty material over a sandy bottom. A shoreline that has grass and rocks right down to the water indicates the presence of a sandy bottom that will be a good location for spawning. A swampy shoreline often indicates the presence of a deep, mucky bottom. Bass will have difficulty building nests there. When bass have to spawn, they'll use the best areas available. That could be inside reed beds, could be in channels, the insides of weed lines, little cuts or coves, shallow water bays, areas that have kind of a sandy base to it. Lakes that have a lot of spawning areas usually have high populations of bass. If they don't have too many spawning areas, the populations are usually small. What this means to me is that we have to protect these areas and we have to protect those fish. I highly recommend leaving alone the areas that the bass are spawning in. As we move into the post-spawn period, the water temperature is well in the upper 60s. Prior to this, fish location was pretty easy. Most of the bass were in shallow water. That isn't the case right now. In fact, there's active fish in shallow water, there's active fish on a flats, there's active fish in deep water. There's cover all over the lake right now. It's almost as full as it's going to be for the year. Right now, let's check out a couple key locations for post-spawn bass fishing. The lily pads and other weeds have grown up in the shallow bays, although they are not as thick as they will be later in the summer. A few groups of larger bass will move in and use this location all summer, feeding on the bass fry and the small bait fish that live here. Reeds have emerged and groups of bass will use the thicker clumps and patches as cover. Out on the flats, in 5 to 10 feet of water, weeds may be up high enough to see from the surface. They are starting to draw enough groups of bait fish to attract the bass. The weeds on the flats will become a lush environment that often holds the majority of the adult bass population in a lake. When you get into deeper water, your depth finder is the only efficient way to find good locations. You're looking for clumps and mats of cover in a deeper waters outside of the flats. Those clumps show up as a thicker band on a flasher. You'll have an easier time finding them if you keep the sensitivity on your depth finder at a higher level. Other areas, not really. What about deep water? I'll tell you what, anything deeper than a weed line this time of year is definitely a waste of time. Most of the fish are relating to shoreline structures. This 15 foot hump out here, not worth your effort at all. Even this five foot sunken island over here, very little fish use. You wanna concentrate on a shoreline structural pieces. A good topo map like this can show you where the big expanses of flats are. You can see the shallow water bay up here. Here's another bay with a big shallow flat off of the front of it. Here's a good looking point. Obviously it's worth checking out. This flat probably has cover on it. Here's another similar looking area. Now to find out where the fish actually are on these structural pieces, you gotta get out here and search the edge of the weed line to find those deep tufts of weeds. You gotta move up on top of the flats. Look and feel with your lures to find out exactly what these fish are doing. In this chapter, We've shown you the key locations that bass use during the pre-spawn, spawn, and post-spawn periods. In the next chapter, we'll show you how environmental conditions affect the strike zone and movement of bass in those locations. In this chapter, Al will describe how local weather and water temperature conditions affect the bass strike zone and location during the pre-spawn, spawn, and post-spawn periods. I've shown you the key locations that bass use in spring of the year. 
Now to be successful, you have to understand how they're behaving in each location. The factors that determine behavior are number one, temperature. That's usually based on local weather conditions. Number two, the hormones of the bass that govern reproduction. These factors can actually determine how the fish will use a given location, even how active they'll be. Before we get into details, I want to review the strike zone concept that we had talked about in the first tape of this series. No doubt about it, bass are fascinating creatures. You could easily spend a lifetime studying bass and their different behaviors. But as anglers, we're mainly concerned with one type of behavior, why bass strike lures, and how we can get them to do it more often. You know, there's a lot of theories why a bass hits lures. Anger, hunger, curiosity, size, color, action, the list goes on and on. But we gotta be careful. Bass don't think or feel like we do. They simply react. They do what they have to do. Our experiences out on a lake can tell us a lot about bass striking lures. Some days the bass seem to hit just about anything. They're aggressive. They chase after fast moving lures and they hit hard. Other days the bass are just turned off. It seems like you need to drop a lure right on their nose to get a strike. We can take observations like these and turn them into a clear, simple theory about bass behavior. One that helps us develop a strategy for catching bass consistently. That theory is called the strike zone concept. It's really a simple idea. What it amounts to is there's an area around the bass that if you make the right presentations with the right lure, he's going to hit it. Now the size of that area is determined by the fish's activity. When they're aggressive, active, that strike zone is pretty big. Fishing's easy. When they're not aggressive, inactive, that strike zone is real restricted. Fishing's tough. It's just that simple. Now this is where the strike zone concepts really come into play. Let's assume that the fish have been active. That means that that strike zone is big. The fish are aggressive, they'll run down most horizontal baits. And that's the key thing to remember, horizontal baits. Baits like this spinner bait, or let's say a crankbait. I could take this crankbait, and if I get it within this strike zone, the odds are this bass will run it down, and I'm gonna catch a fish. Now let's assume a cold front comes through, something that causes a negative effect. That bass's strike zone is gonna get smaller. If I crank this bait out here like this, he's not gonna chase it down. Calls for a change in presentation. You need a slower moving bait, something that's fished vertical, like a slip rig plastic worm, or a jig and eel, or a jig worm. The bass will not chase a far out bait. He's kind of restricted in a key area. That strike zone is very, very small. This vertical presentation has to fall right in front of him. It's almost gotta hit him on the nose to get a triggering response out of them. Now let's take a closer look at how the bass in Little Lake X are behaving in the shallow water, on the flats, and in the deep water. Let's start in a cold water period as it starts to warm up into the pre-spawn period. As the sun warms the water in bays and channels up to the high 40s and low 50s, groups of adult bass will begin to roam up into shallow water. Their strike zones will be relatively large because they are active, searching for warm water and for food. Because the water temperature is still low, they will not be at their peak activity level. Even with shallow water temperatures in the low 50s, there will still be significant numbers of bass in deeper water. It's important to remember that at this time, or any time of year, not all the bass in a lake are doing the same thing at the same time. Early in the spring, the water can cool off as fast as it warms up. Storms, north winds, and cold fronts can quickly drop the temperature in shallow water. The bass may not move out right away, but their strike zones and activity level will drop immediately. And if the shallow water stays cold, the bass tend to move back out to the remnants of cover on the flats or even back into the deeper water. Depending on local weather conditions, this back and forth movement can occur several times until the water finally warms up enough for some bass to begin spawning. You know, when bass like this are on a spawning bed, they're usually easy to catch, especially the males. They'll strike a lure, but it's a territorial strike, not a feeding strike. When you pull that fish in, a whole bunch of bluegills or minnows will swim into that nest and eat up the fry or the eggs. You release the bass, it'll swim back on a nest, 
but it's really too stressed to protect that nest right. I highly recommend leaving alone bass that are spawning. Keep in mind the fact that while one group of bass is spawning, there are probably still bass in the pre-spawn period and some already in post-spawn. It's nature's way of protecting the overall population and your opportunity to fish bass that aren't spawning. When the water temperature out in the main lake reaches the upper 60s, most of the fish are through spawning. You're definitely in a post-spawn period. After spawning, the fish scatter in a lot of different locations. Some bass will make use of shallow water cover. Some bass will go out on the flats and use the new developed weed areas. Some bass will use the existing weeds out on a weed line. Immediately after spawning, the activity level of the bass is very low and the strike zone is real small. Cold fronts and storms still have a chilling effect on the shallow water bass. A quick drop in temperature also affects bass on the flats. Strike zones shrink to almost nothing, and the bass virtually bury themselves in the weeds. In deeper water, temperatures change much more slowly. It's a more stable environment, so the weather has less effect on the bass there. Keep in mind, though, that deep water breaks are not hotbeds of activity during the post-spawn period. The bass there are relatively inactive and here today, gone tomorrow. In the spring, a natural lake isn't exactly what you'd call a stable environment. You've got a lot of temperature changes and the wind is usually blowing a lot and changing directions. The bass are doing a lot of moving. You could pull in one area in the morning, not get a strike. Come in that same area in the afternoon and it's loaded with fish. Because of these constant changes in the environment, it affects our overall strategy. That's what I want to go over in this next chapter. In this chapter, we've shown you how temperature changes are one of the most important factors affecting bass behavior during the spring. In the next chapter, you'll see how this fact affects the locations you fish and how you fish them. In this chapter, Al will describe how he finds the most active groups of bass by selecting presentation techniques that are appropriate for the location and behavior of the fish. Now when a pre-spawn period begins, groups of bass that have been living out here in the deeper weeds and off of the drop-off area start to move into the shallows where the water is getting real warm. Some bass will kind of stay and mill out around the flats at the mouths of these bays and channels and coves, and some bass will still stay in deep water. With the warmer water up here in the shallows, I can catch these fish. These fish out here aren't even worth our time. Man, that water looks good. Plenty high enough, a lot of flooded brush, grass. Water temperature is right. I know there's some fish in here, man. There gotta be, gotta be. It's a good channel, too. Big fish early in the year. One thing about these channels, the fish sure stack in here good early. Ooh, I'm already into 53, 54, jumping back and forth. At a temperature in the low to mid 50s, the bass will be active, but not really in a chasing mood yet. There's no cover or objects out in the middle of the shallow water, so the bass will be hanging tight to the shore in those little pockets and clumps of flooded grass and brush. I need a lure that I can drop right next to the shore. The fish probably aren't active enough to break the surface, so I want to work the bottom. That calls for a jig and eel with a little piece of black pork rind to make it a little more attractive. I cast it just off the shoreline, and then I jig it in and make it hop across the bottom. I put my finger on a line so I can detect any subtle strike. I slowly work my way down to shore, hitting the best looking spots. Don't spend a lot of time jigging a lure. I give it a few hops and then bring it in fast to make another cast. I work my way to the back end of the channel where the warmest water and the most active fish are. Sometimes the strike is short and soft, so I have to concentrate and react quickly. Oh, 
Holy smokes, what a bass! Whoa! Hey, that fish is bigger than I thought it was when she hit. I knew it was big, but that's big. That looks like a Florida bass. That fish has got to go seven pounds. They don't get any bigger than this up north. This is comparable to a 10, 11, or 12 pound southern bass. What a fish. You know, people don't believe big bass like this use channels like this. They think these channels are filled with crappies and bluegills, but in pre-spawn and spawn periods, big bass like this are up in these channels in most of our natural lakes. One thing you want to concentrate on, boy, that's a nice fish, is the back one quarter of these channels, the warmest water. That's where these big mamas like this suck back to like a magnet. It's the warmest water, three, four, five degrees warmer than the front of the channel. Boy, what a fish. I'm gonna put her back so she can have a whole bunch of babies and reproduce a whole bunch of big fish like this. Jig and eel, early in the year in channels, you'll catch fish like this too. The future of quality bass fishing is dependent on catch and release. Putting back the big fish like this one so they can reproduce a gene pool of really good fish. Come on, Gail. Come on. There she goes. Let's check out another good pre-spawn location, shallow bays. The one we're coming into is on the north end of the lake. Water temperature here is in the low 50s, a little cooler than the channel because it's not as isolated from the main lake. We got a lot of area here to cover. This calls for a spinner bait, a tandem with a bright colored skirt. I use a steady retrieve. I don't have to add any action to the lure in this situation. Those double blades have enough action to trigger the bass. See those trees in the background? That's the kind of shelter that really helps this bay warm up fast. Basically, I'm going to fan cast this whole bay, running a boat in a zigzag path searching for active bass. But I don't just cast at random, I look for edges. Clumps of weeds, maybe a sunken log, and try to make casts that hit two or three spots on a single retrieve. You'll find one bass in these conditions, and you'll probably find some more. I keep working the water with that spinnerbait, searching for the active fish. If I go a while without a strike, maybe five or 10 minutes, then I figure it's time to try another spot. If I'm not getting much action in the bay, I move out a little bit to the flats adjacent to the bay. This location can hold bass that are getting ready to come into the bay, or maybe they've been chased out of the bay by a drop in shallow water temperature. In either case, the bass here will have a smaller strike zone than a shallow water bass, so I've got to use a slower presentation, a single bladed spinner bait that I can retrieve with a falling, pumping motion. I want to keep the boat in about four to eight feet of water, where the new weeds are emerging, mixed with what's left of last year's cover. I troll the boat crisscrossing the flats. I can't see any specific targets now, so I just fan cast to cover the area. In my mind, I can see that spinnerbait helicoptering down in the weeds right in front of a big bass. Well, that looks like a, a male for sure. 
It is, it's too skinny to, to be a female. What we had just done is come out on these flats a little further out off of the mouth of the bays like this. We spent enough time in a shallow water bay looking for the largemouth. We got a few fish, but nothing like there will be as soon as that water temperature raises a couple more points. So I left the troll line, fished a little further out into the bay in deeper water. In this case, four to eight foot of water with new developed weed growth on it. And bingo, we made contact right away. Change of lures to a little heavier spinner bait, a single spin, one that is fished up and down instead of a horizontal movement that was so effective in the shallow water. The clean water quick, we made a change in presentation. Whenever you change locations, many cases you have to change presentation, and we had fish contact right away. For the rest of the day, I keep on working at shallow water, making short trips out to the adjacent flats. The bass are really moving around during this period, so a lot of times I'll come back to the spot that was dead earlier in the day, and then I'll get some fish in it. A typical pre-spawn day. A bass on a spawning bed like that is a nice sight. I can be sure of having good bass fishing on this lake in the future. It's so important to wear a pair of Polaroids now. You can see these little light spots. Without them, you can fish right by and never fall that bait right onto where those fish are at. Ooh, bluegills everywhere. I'm fishing a little four-inch plastic lizard rig weedless with a small slip sinker. I just crawl that little lizard across the nest and bang, the male bass hits it to protect the nest. You know, these bass in this channel are all on beds, and there's no question about it. The little lizard with a light slip sinker is probably the best day in and day out way of catching them. Second good choice is a minnow bait like this Rapala, just twitching on top of the bed. These two baits day in and day out for bed and bass are the answer. You know, not every fish in this entire system is all in this channel bedding. We got some bass that are in beds in shallow sheltered bays. We've got some in reeds. We've got some that are gonna spawn in the main lake itself. Now the difference between water temperature from here, which is about 67 degrees, and a main lake is eight or nine points. We can go in the main lake and fish pre-spawn bass with a total different approach. I highly suggest in many cases, leaving these bed and bass alone and whenever possible, hunt the pre-spawners or the late stage post-spawn fish. A typical day on the water for me during the post-spawn period would be something like this. I'd usually start fishing early in the day up in a shallow water. Let's say a protected cove like that, a little bay. You see some bass up on a boat dock. Usually in a shallow area, boat docks start drawing bass this time of the year. Then I'd move up into another little corner like that. Let's say it's a whole big lily pad flat. Then I'd come across to another bay like this. This area is covered in two to four foot of water with real heavy weeds. Some reeds out here, I'd fish out through the reeds. If I was getting action in these shallow water areas, I'd stay. If the action definitely slowed down, I'd leave the shallows, go out to like a point out here on top of this big massive flat. I'd start on the inside of the weed flat, kind of zigzag all the way across it, just fan casting. Again, if I had some activity, I'd stay and work the area pretty thorough. If I didn't, I'd slip off to this edge on a drop off and fish it real quick around the edge. If the fish are on the edge, you get bit right away. If they're not, move across to another location and start the same process all over again. Hey, right now, let's apply these principles out on the water. Ah, what a great day to go fishing. We're definitely into post-spawn. I checked out a couple of spots and didn't see any spawning bass. There's a lot of cover in the lake. Temperature in the main lake is up to about 68 degrees now. Let's start the day in some shallow pads. This location calls for a specialty lure, a type of spoon called a moss boss. You can scoot that moss boss like a little toy boat, splashing it through the open water between the emerging lily pads. 
To add some action to the lure, I give the rod a twitch while I reel it in at a high speed. That combined action makes the lure splash through the water, attracting the attention of any active bass cruising in the pads. There's really no sharp edges yet, so I fan cast the area, covering as much water as fast as I can. Did that fish hit that spoon? Just inhaled it off of the top of the pads. Oh man, you gotta have stout tackle to get him out of this junk. Oh. Come on. Oh. oh man. Come on out of that stuff. Hey, that's one way to get him. Pads and all. For a post-spawn bass, that's a nice fish. It's probably a big male coming out of the shallow water. Hey, now remember, your first choice of lures for cleaning the shallows is a bait you can fish fast. In this case, we're talking about a spoon. The object is to cover a lot of water fast. You're looking for the most aggressive fish, the biters. When you're fishing shallows like this with a spoon, it's common to get a lot of missed fish. The fish will come up and blow behind the spoon, blow it out of the water, and you'll miss them. I'd say you probably hook 50 or 60% of the strikes. When you're missing a lot of fish like that, and you know there's still bass in there, an alternative method that works a lot of times is a slower presentation. In this case, a slip rig plastic worm. Fish real slow in the pockets and holes in the weeds. A thing to remember, when you're fishing shallow water cover like this, fish heavy equipment, a mistake a lot of anglers make is coming in here with too light of equipment. In this case, I'm talking a flipping stick, 20 pound test line. Something that when the bass hits in a cover, you can get them out of there and you won't miss them. To fish the worm, I cast it to an open spot or right into a thick clump of pads. Then I slowly pull it in, jigging it up and down, a slow vertical style of presentation for fish with a small strike zone. As it comes in, I crawl the worm up onto the pads and then let it drop, waiting for a strike. It's an effective presentation, but it's a very slow and deliberate one. It takes a long time to cover water with a worm. That's why the worm isn't my first choice to learn. Ooh, there's a fish. Hey, now remember what we did. We started off earlier, went up in the shallow water with a spoon. We caught a few fish, we missed a few fish. That was our indication to go to a plastic worm, slow down our presentation, fish through the same pad patch again. We got a few more fish on a slower presentation. The sun is getting considerably higher now. The bite in here is really slowing down. I'm gonna pull up, we're gonna head across the lake and go to a big giant flat that has a lot of cover on it and we're gonna hunt some more bass down there. After you fish a lake a few times, you get to know exactly where the good flats are located. But when I'm running a lake for the first time, I keep an eye on a depth finder. That's too deep, no cover. Hey, that's more like it. We're getting into 10 feet of water, and a wide flash indicates good thick clumps of cover. You know, a common mistake that most bass fishermen make especially during a post-spawn fishing conditions like this, is spending too much time in the shallow water in the lily pads, boat docks, reed beds, or spending too much time in the deep water on the drop-offs and missing some of the finest fishing there is, the flats. That area, let's say, from four feet to as deep as 10, where the weeds are just growing up. This is where most of the bass are most of the time during the post-spawn conditions. This is an important time to understand 
versatility. These fish will hit a wide variety of baits. You know, you can catch them on spinner baits, buzz baits, shallow running uh, crank baits, plastic worm top water baits, a little vibrating bait like this with rattles in it, one of my favorite for these situations. Remember, versatility is the key, and spend more time on the flats. Don't spend a lot of time in the shallows and the drop-offs. Start learning to fish the flats, where most of the fish are most of the time. OK, now, how do you think I'm going to fish this flat? Right, I'm going to fan cast it, covering as much water as fast as I can, searching for the active fish. I zigzag through the flat with the trolling motor while I fish it. In this location, the active fish will be up high in the weeds. Their strike zones will be large, so this fast-moving, horizontal presentation should get them to strike. I use a plain, steady retrieve. I don't need to add any action to this lure. OK, that's enough for this bait. You know, we fished this whole flat with this bait, and I never had a strike. It's a good flat. It's big. It's got big tufts of weeds all over it. The weed growth is from 4 to about 10 feet of water. It's got to have bass on it. The first family of lures didn't produce. I'm going to change to a spinner bait, a bait that I can fish slower, vertical. It'll fall down over the mats of weeds, fall into the pockets, a more subtle presentation. Remember, when you're fishing post-spawn fish, versatility is the key to putting fish in a boat consistently. I keep the boat cruising over the flats. I'm fishing a little slower with the spinner bait, but not as slow as I'd fish with, say, a slip-rigged worm. When I fish slower, I really concentrate more. That quick action excitement just isn't there now. In my mind, I follow that spinner bait as it pumps up and then flutters down into the weeds. Oh, there he is. <laughs> I knew there had to be some fish here. There had to be a few on this flat. The conditions were too right. Had to be a few. Nice fish, too. That spinnerbait was the answer. I probably fished through this fish earlier and didn't trigger him. You know, remember, for the most consistent bass bite during the post-spawn period, concentrate on these flats. Most of the fish during this period of time are going to be one to three pound bass. That even includes the shallow water fish. The female bass, the four, fives, and sixes, are not real aggressive during post-spawn. However, there is one place you can go that you'll up your odds for big fish. That's the drop-off areas. The fishing is usually hit and miss. They're here today, gone tomorrow, one or two fish at best. But that's where your odds are the best for catching the big female bass. And that's where we're going from here. To find those good deep water spots, I really depend on my depth finder. I keep the sensitivity turned way up so I can get a better picture of what the bottom's like. We're still out in deep water, too deep for weeds or bass. There we go. When the bottom starts coming up and a flash of marks get wide, that's the deep weeds on a drop-off. I'm using one of my all-time favorite lures here, a worm on an exposed jig hook. I throw my boat a few yards outside the weed line so I'm not directly over the location that I'm trying to fish. I'm watching the depth finder to keep the boat in a constant depth, in this case about 15 feet. If I come in too close and start reading the weeds again, I steer out a little. If I get too deep, I turn in. I cast a jig worm right up to the weed line or a little into the weeds and just let it settle and drift down. I jig the rod tip up and down and snap the lure off any weeds that it may settle into. I like to keep my finger on a line because the strike usually comes as the lure is dropping. It's a soft, subtle strike, and I got to set the hook quick. The key is to keep tension on a line. I'm always ready to set the hook. In this kind of fishing, you set the hook a lot and find there's no fish, they're just weeds. Panfish tend to nibble on the worm, too. 
But if you don't set your senses on a hair trigger, you're gonna miss a lot of bass. It's a real mental kind of presentation. I see in my mind where the weed line is and what the jigworm looks like drifting down into those clumps of deep weeds. Oh, they're right on the end of the point. Right where that fish should have been, a deep mat of weeds. Oh, she's coming up. Oh. Whoa, oh, that, that's the kind of drop off bass we're talking about. Oh. That's the kind of fish we're hunting out here. Whoa. Now, when we're talking spawned out female bass in natural lakes, that's what I mean. That fish is a giant. Uh. Hey, I'll tell you what, I love catching those bass on a drop-off. And the best way to take them during a post-spawn period is on a little exposed jig head like this with a six, seven, or eight inch plastic worm. Just like that, a simple system that really produces a lot of fish during this time of the year. These weeds are not real heavy yet on these points. They're just little mats of them developing, and that little light jig head just kind of lays on top of the weeds, and you just kind of pop it off. You'll feel it sink a little bit, and that bass will go bam. There is another method that is pretty effective at this time of the year is your standard crankbait. Take a crankbait, drop your trolling motor, and fish around the whole point, and sometimes you'll feel tufts of weeds with the crankbait. Stop, pick up the jig, work that tuft the weed if you don't get a fish, keep on going down. In some cases, that crankbait becomes a search lure. You know, the most important thing to, to remember on post-spawn bass is that you got a lot of fish doing different things at different times. There's fish scattered all over the lake. That's the reason why you keep moving and moving and moving, fishing many different situations. Hey, right now you should have a pretty good idea about early season bass fishing. You concentrate on high percentage areas. You look for the most aggressive fish in each given area. You choose lures that you can fish fairly fast with and still be efficient. You know, you're gonna be catching more bass now than ever before. Please practice catch and release. Hey, I got a challenge for you. We're gonna go to another body of water. I want you to make some of your own decisions. We're gonna compare notes and I wanna see what you learn. As you take the challenge, keep your finger on the pause button of your VCR and have your guidebook handy. The guidebook will give you more information about each challenge question along with the right answers. Hey, I'll tell you what, this water's really warming up fast. The weed growth is getting pretty thick. For all practical purposes, the majority of the bass are off the spawning beds. We're gonna take a ride around the lake, and I want you to pick the first spot that you think we should start in. There's deep water here, about 30 feet. The weeds on this flat are almost up to the surface already. The lily pads in a shallow bay aren't nearly as thick as they will be later in the summer. This lake has got some good thick reed beds on it. Which location would you fish first? And more importantly, why? Pause or stop your VCR here and think about your answer. Then restart your VCR. Okay, good choice. But now, what's going to be the best lure to fish in this location? Pause your VCR here and pick a lure. Also, think about why that would be the best lure. What's Al doing to work this lure? Why is he doing it that way? How are the bass probably behaving in this location? Stop or pause your VCR while you think about it.
Okay, we found an active bass pretty quick, but what if that lure didn't work? What would be a good second choice lure for the less active bass in this location? Which of these lures would be best for less active fish in these shallow pads? Why? Pause the VCR while you make your selection. The sun is higher in the sky now. The shallow water bite really dropped off. Let's try another location. You watch the depth finder too and tell me when it indicates a spot we should try. As you watch the depth finder, make a mental note about which reading indicates the next spot you want to try. Think about what the reading means. Think about why you want to fish there. Watch those readings again. right on the edge of a big flat with weeds almost to the surface. What lure would you pick to find the active fish in this location? Pause the VCR while you select a lure. Think about why you picked that one. Okay, we found an active bass pretty quick on a small crankbait. Ordinarily, we'd stay with this lure and really cover these flats as efficiently as possible. But let's say a cold front had gone through and we wanted to fish the less active bass on these flats. What lure would you use now? And when you've picked a lure, picture in your mind how you would fish it. Now let's take a quick swing out to the deeper water and see if we can find some of those big bass using the clumps of weeds down there. You keep your eyes on the depth finder and tell me when you think we're over some good clumps. Do you see a good reading? Which sequence is it? Why is it a good reading? Okay, we're fishing in about 20 feet of water here, just off some real deep clumps of cabbage weed. What lure do you think will be best here? What about these choices? Does anything look good to you? Why?
Hey, by now I'm sure you realize that there's a lot of ways to catch bass. You know, nothing in fishing is 100%. The fact of the matter is many of the locations and lure choices we've been going over don't work all the time, but they do work most of the time. And that's what we want you to understand. These are guides, they're principles to point you in the right direction to help you to start to catch fish more consistently. Hey, don't go on the water and have a set idea of what fishing should be. Keep an open mind always. And remember one thing, the greatest fishing tool you have is right here. In the first tape of this mastery series, we showed you the foundation of fishing knowledge. In this tape, we showed you how to apply that knowledge to spring conditions. In the next tapes, we'll show you how to apply that same knowledge to summer and fall conditions. Hey, thanks for watching this program, and to get the most out of it, make use of your guidebook along with this video cassette. And remember, have fun and go out fishing.